Well, we have, we have come on quite a journey that's taken us through the life and the work of uh, the prophet Daniel. We've, we've, uh, we've seen uh, the scope and the impact of uh, God's work in his life. We've uh, seen how God used him to communicate some very important messages, uh, both to the Gentile world and to his own people. Uh, and through uh, quite a bit of, of biographical uh, detail, we, we've seen his, his character displayed and how his desire to, to be God's witness to the world uh, really just permeated his life. Um, we've also seen, on a grander scale, broader themes at play. Uh, we saw how the, uh, the supernatural in, in general and you know, predictive prophecy in particular is not only possible, but that is the, one of the primary mechanisms that God uses to validate his existence and to uh, demonstrate his, his sovereignty over the affairs of man. Uh, one of the purposes that God has for this book is to tell his people through Daniel what will happen to them, uh, both in the near future and in the, the distant future. Uh, to, de- to tell them what he will do so that, th- so that they will understand um, that although sometimes circumstances may appear otherwise, that he is in control and that he will be faithful to his promises. Uh, so the first part of the book has uh, thus far been uh, chronological, but we're, we, we reach the end of Daniel's life, and so God gives us really a peek into his, his heart and mind. And so in this next section of Daniel, we're going to jump back uh, into uh, and see various episodes of Daniel's life and and see some of the amazing visions and and dreams that God gave him along the way. Uh, So again, we're we're not moving forward chronologically uh, anymore. We will see uh, two visions that Daniel had back during the Babylonian uh, Empire and then two visions that God gave him during the Medo-Persian Empire. Uh, after Babylon fell. And that's, that's what really contains the rest, the rest of the book contains. So, um, so as we move f- from the more uh, biographical portions of Daniel into the more prophetic, uh, the question comes up again, why are we studying prophecy? Why did God consider it so important to lay out for us what uh, would happen in the future? And many people say, why don't we just concern ourselves with the here and now? So why is prophecy so important? Uh, Dr. Uh, Charles Feinberg, um, uh, he's a, a preeminent a conservative scholar and a Jewish believer. He suggests some reasons why believers should study prophecy. So here's a few of his answers. First, it will bring us closer to God. Uh, God does not reveal things to servants, but rather to friends. Uh, prophecy invites us into the deepest plans of God into a, a deeper relationship with God. Secondly, it uh, gives us knowledge of the overarching purposes of God. It, uh, it opens up horizons and it helps us to see things on a, a grander scale. Uh, it helps us to even see things from God's perspective. And that's something that's going to be uh, important in this chapter, in, in chapter 7. Next, it gives us hope. Uh, trials and struggles and suffering sometimes cause us to look downward and inward. Uh, Hope draws us out of our circumstances and focuses our eyes toward heaven. Seeing the the end of the story in advance gives us confidence that God is working. It gives us hope that, you know, the hope that we need to be able to move forward. When Israel was in captivity and had seemingly lost everything, what did God give them? prophecy, right? And what did that prophecy do for them? It gave them hope. Uh, Next, he says it gives us uh, the proper view of history. So we we tend to to view things from man's perspective, Uh, but we are fallen, frail, broken creatures, Um, and our view of the world and and history has been warped by sin. Uh, We are looking at the world through, through broken, cracked lenses, 
Uh, so seeing the world through the prophetic lens really uh, realigns our perspectives and, and helps us to focus on what's truly important. And then uh, lastly, he says, um, it helps our Christian walk. So it helps us develop an eternal perspective. And, and we can see the relative value of things, uh, the things of this world. It helps us to, to focus on Christ and his purposes and aligns our priorities with, with his. So what is the purpose of prophecy? Well, we discussed this back in chapter 2. It helps to give us uh, confidence in the reality of the unseen world. Uh, of the eternal kingdom of Christ. We, we, we discussed how prophecy was even more of a sure word than the disciples, uh, the, the apostles experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, no, it says, No prophecy ever come, came from the will of man, but men spoke from God. So through, through the prophets, we hear the voice of God, giving us confidence that the, the transcendent and the eternal is, is just as real as the material things we see around us. Uh, but in the, the context of Daniel, uh, through prophecy, God was giving hope to a people who had lost everything. They thought that their God had either failed them or forgotten them uh, or abandoned them. Uh, they thought God had, had maybe turned their back, his back on them. Uh, but it's amazing to see how, how God... Uh, was a loving shepherd to his people, even through their, their time of punishment. Uh, we've seen this all the way through Daniel so far, how uh, early on in their captivity, he gave them hope through this, this dream, uh, this statue, uh, uh, through uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that he still had a future for them, and that he was in control. And then now here at the end of their captivity, he reiterates the same message, that he is in control of history. God never leaves us without hope, and he does that through prophecy. Uh, there are many more reasons, but I think, I think prophecy is by far the most undervalued, misunderstood aspects of, of God's revelation to us. And it is one of the most important uh, things that we can study, especially in the times that we live. So, uh, as to this uh, particular chapter, uh, Dr. John Walvoord, who is called by some the, the dean of prophecy, um, of modern prophecy. He's, he's now with the Lord. But uh, he wrote one of the great uh, prophecies of the Bible, talking about Daniel 7. Um, he said, one of the great prophecies of the Bible and the key to the entire program of God from Babylon to the second coming of Christ and provides the most comprehensive and detailed prophecy of future events to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. So those are pretty, some pretty strong words. And I don't think he overstated the case. We saw a, a preview of this same content back in chapter 2 uh, with the, the vision of the giant statue. But here the description gets even more detailed. Uh, author Rodney Stortz wrote uh, concerning this uh, passage, or this is the section of Scripture. He said, I would venture to say that most Christians could not tell you what is contained in chapters 7 through 12 of Daniel. Uh, some people do not study the prophecies of Daniel 7 through 12 because they are convinced they will never be able to understand them. Other people do not study these chapters because they think the prophecies are too frightening. Listen, if, prophes if these prophecies trouble you or disturb you, you're in good company. Daniel 7 15 says, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit, and the visions that passed through my mind disturbed me. And I, I think that's true. Uh, the, the first six chapters are much more accessible, uh, much easier to navigate because they, they basically tell a story. Um, and the last six chapters require a little bit of digging, uh, a little bit of uh, a background and putting the pieces together to really understand. But isn't that how things are in life? The things that are worthwhile take a little bit of sweat and effort. Um, also, in the first six chapters, the, the nature, uh, character, the power, and the sovereignty of God are explored. Uh, which then set up our understanding and our confidence that he is able to foretell the future uh, in the final six chapters. So without that, that foundation of the first half, the second half wouldn't really make any sense. So just to review, as we explored back in chapter 2, we saw that Daniel is a unique book in the Bible because it was written in two different languages. 
Uh, it begins in Hebrew, and then in the middle of chapter 2, it shifts into Aramaic, the common Gentile tongue of the day. And then after the end of chapter 7, it, it goes back to Hebrew for the rest of the book. The question is why? Why, these, um, why, why there are these, these two different languages in these two different sections? Well, there, these, uh, these sections have different audiences and different subject matters. Uh, the Bible generally discusses uh, history, both past and future, uh, through the lens of Israel. But as we've seen, the, these portions of Daniel are an exception to that rule. In chapter 4, we see the, the, the proclamation by, by Nebuchadnezzar to the known world of, of his repentance and how he embraced the God of Israel. Um, so that would obviously make more sense to be written in the, the lingua franca of the day, in the language people could understand. Um, the people in his kingdom spoke Aramaic, so, so Daniel wrote that portion in Aramaic. Now, the rest of this, this biographical section in, um, in this first half also deals with the times of the Gentiles and all these going, goings on in, in Babylon, as well as detailed accounts of the upcoming Gentile world empire. So that makes sense that that would be, again, in the language of the day, in Aramaic. But then starting in chapter 8, it shifts to the future and fate of Israel. Um, and that's, that's now in focus. So Daniel switches back to Hebrew. So here, chapter 7, is the last bit of that Aramaic section. So as we get to chapter 7 here, it, it's good to keep in mind what we discovered back in chapter 2. So these chapters are parallel in uh, quite a few ways, and we're going to see that tonight. Uh, what we saw was that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the known world, had a dream which troubled him. And he used that opportunity to test the advisors that he had inherited from his father. So these were the guys who were supposed to have a connection to the spiritual realm. And so Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to prove it. So Nebuchadnezzar had, had he the, this disturbing dream, and he wanted his advisors to not only interpret the dream, but to tell him what it was. And they obviously couldn't do that. But it was not impossible for God. So God revealed to Daniel both the dream and its interpretation. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, again, was of a giant metal statue which represented Gentile world domination from Nebuchadnezzar's time until the second coming. Now, there were four distinct parts of the statue which corresponded to four empires. The first and best part of the statue was the head of gold, and that represented Nebuchadnezzar himself, who was re really the embodiment of Babylon. Uh, next was the arms and chest of silver, um, and uh, that represented the Medo-Persian Empire. Next we have the belly and thighs of, of brass, which represented Greece and uh, Alexander the Great. And then the last section was the legs, uh, the legs of iron, and this represented Rome. Uh, but then the, the most important uh, part of the dream came next. And um, so after that we saw the, this, uh, after we saw the glorious statue, the, the shocking part was that this stone cut without hands comes in from the outside and destroys all that mankind had built. This, this incredible, beautiful monument to uh, the accomplishments of man, this, this pinnacle of human achievement, was, was completely destroyed in a moment. Uh, so the stone grows into a mountain which fills the whole earth. And that, again, uh, was, was uh, the kingdom of God uh, coming through the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, so that review is important to get into our minds uh, so we can see the, the parallels here in, in chapter 7. And not only the parallels, but the contrasts as well. So you've got there a handout that talks about the comparison and, and contrast between chapters 2 and 7. I'm sure it's too, too small to read up here, but you've got it in front of you there. So um, some of these uh, comparison and, and, and contrasts. In Daniel 2, you have a dream, Daniel 7, dreams and visions. In two, you have, it was given to Nebuchadnezzar. In seven, it was given to Daniel. In two, it was given to an unbeliever, a pagan king. And seven was given to a man of God. Two was a humanistic view of history. And chapter seven was a theocratic view of history. Uh, two was a Gentile kingdoms from man's perspective. And here in seven, a Gentile kingdom from God's perspective as brutal beasts devouring one another. 
chapter, chapter 2 was uh, what the kingdoms looked like externally, their reputation among men. 7 is what God knows the kingdoms are internally, their character before God. Uh, seven, uh, 2 was, was interpreted by Daniel. 7 was interpreted by an angel. Chapter 2, uh, we have four metallic subdivisions and one stone. 7 is four beasts and one son of man. Uh, chapter 2 is ten toe stage. And then chapter 7 is the ten horn stage. Uh, chapter 2, that ten toe stage is smashed by a stone. And 7, the ten horns give rise to a little horn whose dominion is taken away and destroyed forever. And then finally, in, in 2, the stone becomes the great mount which fills, which fills the whole earth and the kingdom endures forever. And in 7, the Son of Man receives a kingdom everlasting dominion which will not pass away or be destroyed. So a lot of, a lot of parallels, a lot of contrasts, a lot of um, interesting things to sort of uh, springboard off of. One issue that we are going to be confronted with is that while Daniel has, has witnessed the, the instability of governments and world powers and, and the corruption that can come from those who really are only invested in themselves, uh, like Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, his pride was all-consuming. Because of that, we can, we can end up uh, focusing on only ourselves. And this, this takes the focus off of God uh, when, when uh, mankind is like that, and, and the attention that God so rightly deserves. Uh, this corruption was, was fully on display in, in Daniel's world um, and how they, they disregarded human life the immorality and uh, you know, all that that was, that was all around them. Yet, uh, this corruption and this, this godless society that comes from such a, a man-centered worldview is only part of the story. It, it really just scratches the surface of what's truly going on. There is a, a sinister and wicked, uh, evil undercurrent flowing beneath this world system that sometimes it's not uh, fully apparent. So we're going to see in the next uh, this chapter and, and, and going forward, the curtain pulled back, especially in chapter 10, to, to reveal a, a world of, of evil spirits and demonic activity that um, it helps us understand that, that there is a satanic authorship behind these these so-called human accomplishments or achievements. Uh, when we say that, that we are involved in spiritual warfare, I, I think we sometimes are, are naive to what that really means. And, and the hint that we get here in chapter 7, that that's where Daniel is headed, is um, you know, the, the idea that this wickedness below the surface is that God is going to reveal that to us. We, we get that hint in how these, these same four world empires are presented in a different light uh, in chapter 7 than they were in chapter 2. Back in chapter 2, how were these empires presented? As a beautiful, shiny metal statue, right? Majestic and, and glorious. And it was a statue of a man, right? Now this statue, these, these world kingdoms, that's the best the world has to offer. This is man's crowning achievement. But the valuation in, in, in how the... This, this valuation is basically how the world sees this accomplishment. Chapter 2 is laying out the succession of world empires from man's perspective. When we get to chapter 7, what do we see? We see these same four world empires, but how do they appear? As hideous, voracious beasts. In reality, they are not uh, glorious in the least. They are horrible, disgusting creatures. So this is the view of Gentile world history from God's perspective. Uh, they aren't bright, shiny metals. They're vile creatures. And remember how we said that Daniel is not just reporting history. Uh, it, it's a commentary on history. This is God's commentary on what these world empires truly represent. These kingdoms, they belong to Satan. He is the God of this world, so it, it, it's no wonder that they're corrupt. And God shows us their true character in Daniel 7. So this is quite a contrast, you know, how man views his crowning achievement 
uh, versus how God views man's efforts apart from him and really in defiance to him. So in chapter 2, what, is, uh, what do we see man doing to the statue? Bowing down and worshiping it, right? So isn't that just typical? What, what man creates, man worships. What we, we think what we have to offer is so wonderful, but you know, what we have created in terms of these various forms of government and political movements and the, and the domination um, that comes from such power, all of that in the final evaluation is just something horrible and ugly in God's eyes. You know, if we think about all the, the, the death and destruction that have come from um, you know, sim- the, the, simply the purpose of establishing and maintaining these world empires, so in God's eyes, even our righteousness is like filthy rags. So this is quite the contrast that Daniel is giving us. It's an insight into the mind of God. So again, what is this time period referring to that this, this statue represents and what the four beasts represent? Back in chapter 2, we, we, we uh, pointed out it's called the times of the Gentiles. Okay, this comes from Luke 21, 24, that, where Jesus says that Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So Daniel chapters 2 and 7 are really just a detailed description of what uh, Jesus was referring to. So again, what are these times of the Gentiles? It's it's basically a timeline that measures out world domination through successive world powers from Daniel's time until the second coming. Uh, we, We showed how prior to Babylon there were you know, some regional powers like Egypt and Assyria, but there really wasn't an empire that ruled the world. But from Babylon on, uh, God reveals to Nebuchadnezzar that there will be four and only four uh, empires that will rule the world until he returns to set up his kingdom. So again, this timeline is called the Times of the Gentiles. It gives um, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 and Daniel in chapter 7 a picture of what empires are going to rule the world. But Jesus also ties this together with the fact that Jerusalem um, is going to be trampled underfoot. So along with Gentile world domination, the times of the Gentiles also describe a time when Gentiles hold power, hold sway over the city of Jerusalem and over the nation of Israel politically. But don't confuse the, the times of the Gentiles with the uh, fullness of the Gentiles. That's a phrase that Paul uses in Romans 11.25 to refer to the number of those that God is calling to himself uh, during the church age out of the, the population of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles. He said... Um, yeah, he said that uh, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And thus, or and then, all Israel will be saved. So he's talking about there is a certain number of Gentiles that are going to be saved in the church. When that's complete, when that number you know, hits the right number, that's the fullness. And then the, the clock stops and God shifts his program. Um, okay, so... Um, again, the, 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 the times of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles are two, two distinct ideas. So let's jump into chapter 7, starting in verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. So it starts out in the first year of Belshazzar. Okay, this year would be about uh, five... Uh, 53 B.C., about 50 years after the, Daniel's interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream back in chapter 2. And then about 14 years before Belshazzar's um, party in Daniel 5. So in, in terms of chronology, it places the vision after Daniel 4, but before Daniel 5. Like I said, we're jumping back into Daniel's life to, to take a look at some uh, vision and prophecies. Uh, so you can see there from the chart um, how these four visions in the last half of Daniel relate to the timeline. So the first two, like I said, uh, happened during Babylon, and the last two happened during Medo- Medo-Persia. Uh, so Daniel, again, is no, is no longer proceeding chronologically. Um, Daniel here is a, probably about 67 years old, 
And Nebuchadnezzar has probably been dead nine or ten years. Um, so, we made a, a distinction earlier about uh, between uh, dreams and visions. And said so dreams are basically when you're asleep and visions when you're awake. Now, well, here it says dreams and visions. So, maybe he started out as a dream and it was so disturbing it woke him up and it became a vision. But, um, uh, either case, it, 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 uh, it happened while he, uh, while he was on his bed. So, it, it's a minor point, but... It doesn't really seem to matter since God communicates to Daniel in both dreams and visions. But Daniel knew it was so important, he wrote it down. Uh, verse 2 it says, Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So Daniel shifts here from being the narrator to first person. And What's striking about this is Daniel is, is no longer relating and interpreting dreams that were given to someone else. These are now dreams that God considered so important that gave direct, he gave directly to Daniel. Uh, we can see um, a possible structure in this chapter uh, by, this, the, by these phrases. The first, the first one comes in chapter, I mean, sorry, in verse uh, 2. It says, I was looking in my vision by night. And in this section, we see the first three beasts introduced. Verse 7, it says, I kept looking in the night visions. Okay, sort of a parallel phrase there. In that section, the fourth beast is described along with his judgment and destruction. Then in verse 13, it says, I kept looking in the night visions. And in that section, we see the coming of the Son of Man and the kingdom being given over to the saints. And then lastly, in verse 15, it says, the visions in my mind that kept alarming me. Uh, here we're given an explanation, really, of, of what it all means. Uh, so we begin here in verse 2 with the unveiling of these first three beasts. It says, The four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So there are several nuances to this that might help us figure out what this great sea is referring to. Now, first of all, the Mediterranean is often called the great sea in, in Scripture. Several passages there that, uh, that mention that. Um, all four of these kingdoms really do border the, the Mediterranean. So they can be seen as, as, in some sense, arising from or, or drawing their life from the great sea. But another aspect of this, of this sea is, is that it's used as an idiom for a, a mass of humanity. Jesus uses it that way in Matthew thirteen forty seven. And Isaiah also in chapter 7 and 57. In Revelation 17, 15, it says, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So in a sense, these empires rise up from the Gentile mass of humanity. Uh, later in this chapter, in verse 17, Daniel says that the beasts rise from the earth. Uh, so there is definitely a, a symbolic understanding of the sea here. It goes on to say in verse 3, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. So, so here we see where the beasts come from. We, we see that uh, the four beasts represent four kingdoms and that they're clearly symbolic, uh, representing something else. So I, I think it's a safe bet to say that the sea itself is more than just the Mediterranean. It's, it's also symbolic for, for humanity or, or the earth or, or a combination of the two. So let's take a look at the first beast in verse 4. It says, The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was also given to it. So this first beast is probably one we're most familiar with, uh, since we've been immersed in, in it for, for most of the book of Daniel. Uh, this, this lion with wings of an eagle is Babylon. Uh, now, earlier we saw pictures of uh, the Ishtar Gate, which is covered with these images of winged lions. Um, and this was a symbol that you would find uh, of Babylon all throughout the city, these, these lions with these wings. Um, here is an example of a winged lion uh, Babylon gate relief found in the Louvre Museum in Paris. Uh, 
so as Daniel and his friends were, were carted off to Babylon, and they would uh, enter the city through the processional way, they would see these winged lions uh, lining that the processional way up and down. Uh, so Babylon was known for both its ferociousness and for the speed with, it, with, with which it conquered its, its enemy. So the regal lion and the, the majestic eagle really perfectly um, represent the, the majesty of what Babylon represented. But notice it does not say it was a lion. It says it was like a lion. It resembled a lion in some respects. Uh, so the image of um, Babylon being, being represented as a lion and uh, also the images of an eagle is used uh, of Babylon in Scripture um, in uh, Jeremiah in several places and at other places as well. But notice here it says that the, its wings were plucked. So what is that reminiscent of? Right? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar being taken out of commission for a while. Right? If his wings were plucked, he could no longer fly to conquer his enemies. And it says here that he was made to stand on two feet like a man, and a human mind was given to it. Uh, we saw how Nebuchadnezzar was, was, was a, a beast crawling on all fours, and then God allowed his reason to return to him so he could stand on two feet again. And he no longer had a beast's mind, uh, but was able to reason again like a man. Many also see here uh, a hint that, uh, uh, that uh, this transformation from beast to man is picturing God's saving Nebuchadnezzar. The word here translated mind, lab, is also translated heart. Um, so God, in, uh, God giving him a new heart, that's, you know, that's new covenant language, that God will exchange our heart of stone for a heart of flesh. So that, that seems like it, it's, it's uh, a reference to Nebuchadnezzar being saved. So this first beast is really the, the best of the bunch. I mean, it's, um, he's more beastly in the beginning and more human at the end. Uh, these four kingdoms really go from, from bad to, to horribly bad by the end. Uh, so just like the various metals in chapter 2, they represent uh, different values of the successive empires. Um, the first one is given a, a human mind, so it's not quite so bad. And then the next three become more and more brutal. So with the, uh, the last one, is, is so, so extreme that Daniel can't even come up with a, an animal counterpart to symbolize it. It's just, he just calls it uh, dreadful and, and terrifying. Um, you know what, let's take a quick uh, five-minute break. I know it's hard to sit for so long, and then we'll come back and, and jump into the next, the next few beasts. Okay, so verse 5, I think that's where we left off, the second beast. He says, and uh, behold, another beast, a second one, resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, arise, devour much meat. So we come to the second beast here. Daniel says that this beast was like a bear. Again, it's not a bear, it's bear-like. So corresponding to the, the arms and chest of silver, uh, this, is, uh, this bear represents uh, Medo-Persia. Uh, and we'll get into a lot more detail uh, about this kingdom in chapter 8. Um, so anyway, unlike a, a lion, a bear is slow and, and pondering and in, in, in its movement. It's very powerful, but it does not move rapidly like a lion. The bear is stronger, but less majestic than a lion. And that, this corresponds perfectly to what we know of Medo-Persia. Uh, they, were, uh, they were large, slow, powerful um, force. They were, they were much bigger than Babylon. In, in their wars with Greece, they had amassed a two and a half million man army. And that's large by today's standards. So, you know, you hear about, you read about story about battles in the Bible, and they you know, had 30,000 men, or, you know, sometimes a little bigger, but a two and a half million man army. So they would simply just overwhelm their opponents with sheer force. Uh, they eventually had to, to fight relatively few battles because their enemies would surrender before they even arrived. 
Uh, it says here also that it was raised up on one side. Now, uh, most commentators note that this would correspond to the fact that there were two factions in the Medo-Persian Empire. We, we discussed earlier how Cyrus was half Median and half Persian, and how he also placed his, his Median uncle, Darius, over Babylon um, after it was conquered. So, um, while Media and, and, and Persia were, were partners at first, the Persians came to dominate this partnership and eventually absorbed the Medes into the Persian Empire. Um, we're we're going to get to that in just a second. Yeah, yeah I think that's the, that's the raised up on one side part. Is, uh, well, John Walvoord, he comments on this. He says, Persia at this time, although coming up last, was by far the greater and more powerful and had absorbed the Medes. This is represented also in Daniel 8 by the two horns of the ram, with the horn that come up last being higher and greater in Daniel 8.3. The ram with its unequal horns, horns is identified as the kings of Media and Persia. So back in chapter 2, the only identification, positive identification we, we had was Babylon was the head of gold. And then we assumed the rest uh, from history. But in Daniel 8, it actually identifies uh, the ram as the kings of Media and Persia. Uh, so the statement, uh, it raised itself up on one side... Uh, can also be translated uh, raised up one dominion. So that would support this idea that the Persians came to be more dominant. Um, in Daniel, the, the, the famous legal standard was, was phrased as the law of the Medes and the Persians, but by the time we get to Esther, it actually says the law of the Persians and the Medes. Um, so we'll, um, we'll, see in, uh, we'll see this in chapter 8 with, the, with that ram with two horns, uh, one again, which, which, which grows longer and takes over the other. It also says that three ribs were in its mouth uh, between its teeth. And most historians recognize that there were pr three primary victories that established Medo-Persia uh, in its dominance. And the first was a victory over the kingdom of Lydia in 546. Lydia was, was fabulously wealthy. Uh, you probably heard of its king, Croesus, and he's where we get the, uh, the ancient expression, as rich as Croesus. Uh, the kingdom of Lydia was, was basically what we would call Asia Minor, or Turkey today, modern Turkey. And that's where we're, uh, the Apostle Paul basically went on, on his missionary journeys. The city of Sardis was the capital. Uh, there are a lot of stories about how Croesus got to be so rich. Uh, Herodotus says that the Lydians were the first to introduce the use of gold and silver coins. Uh, but regardless, Cyrus needed that wealth to, to raise and support and finance his massive army. So that was the first major victory for Cyrus when, it was when he conquered Lydia. Next, he conquered Babylon in 539 B.C., uh, the, the ruling world power at the time. And we, we talked about this at length in the last chapter. Uh, this is also described in detail in Isaiah 13 and Jeremiah 50 and 51, as well as other places. Uh, then Cyrus also conquered Egypt in 525. Yes, they, they had hung around after Nebuchadnezzar had put them down uh, back in um, 586. Um, most commentators explain that uh, this is what those three ribs would refer to. So the major conquests of, of Cyrus in becoming an empire. And then in verse 5, the, the kingdom is told to uh, arise and devour much meat. And there's not really much detail about you know, what this means, but God, God had raised up Babylon for the purpose of punishing his people, right? But then he also promised that he was going to punish Babylon uh, as well. So he raised up Medo-Persia uh, for this uh, purpose of, of, of punishing uh, Babylon. So I think that's probably what the devour much meat has, has reference to. And this Persian Empire lasted for 200 years, all the way until the time of Alexander the Great. In verse 6 it says, After this I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. So this next beast is a little bit different than the first two. It's It's um, not only is it a composite creature in that it's 
compared to a, a leopard, but also has wings. But also it is described as having four heads, which brings up another issue is that you will find endless pictures or drawings sort of envisioning or trying to imagine what what these beasts might have looked like and they're usually pretty silly um, but it kind of misses the point because these are symbols or idioms they're descriptions that Daniel is giving to try to give us a sense for what he saw so the drawings that you see are, are sometimes in a sense uh, pointless so um, there's some drawings of this, the little horn of <laughs> Daniel that are really hilarious. Uh, so this third, this third beast uh, corresponds to the third section in the statue and the belly and thighs of, of brass, uh, which refers to the kingdom of Greece. And just like in the materials in the, st the statue in chapter 2, we see a deterioration in um, moving from beast to beast in terms of ferociousness and, and the regal character of the beast. So we've, we've gone downhill. So this kingdom is pictured uh, as being like a leopard, one of the fastest of all animals. But not only is this leopard fast, but this beast is pictured as having wings to give it additional speed. In fact, it says it was given four wings. So maybe that's in contrast to the, the wings of an eagle of a lion. So it's even faster than that. Alexander the Great conquered the world so quickly. It was astonishing. Uh, in the next chapter, it's described as being so fast that it doesn't even seem to, uh, his feet don't even seem to touch the ground. Uh, in just a few years, less than 10 years, Alexander conquered the known world. And this was with a small army compared to this two and a half million man uh, Medo Persian army. So now we see, we see the lion devours, the bear crushes. And the leopard springs upon its prey. And that, that's, I think that's a pretty apt description of how uh, Greece obtained their victories. Uh, the speed at which, which Alexander moved was really unmatched in the ancient world. Uh, it was said that at the age of 29 that he fell on his bed and wept because there were no more worlds left to conquer. So, and that's, that's sad in one respect. But it's amazing in another respect that he literally conquered the world by age 29. And he expanded, expanded the size of the Medo Persian Empire even farther, all the way out to um, India. Um, so these, these four heads are interesting uh, in that when Alexander died, he was asked, To whom does the kingdom go? And he replied, Give it to the strong, which is a recipe for disaster. So. Can't imagine their staff meetings after that. Um, so after 40 years of warfare, the, these four generals eventually divided up this, this massive empire uh, between them. It, it reached from, from Greece all the way to India. So just the administration alone of, of trying to control this, this large, unwieldy empire was, was probably something only Alexander could, could accomplish. So they divided it. Yeah, the generals, yeah, they're listed, listed there as well. So the, um, the four heads, I, I believe they clearly represent the four generals that took over after Alexander died. And we're going to see these guys in more detail in the coming chapters, but for now, the, um, they represented four different areas, Lysimachus, Cassander, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. Uh, Lysimachus uh, received Thrace and most of Asia Minor. So there's a map there. And you've got a, a color printout of this so you can see the... Uh, the different uh, regions. Uh, Cassander, uh, he got uh, Macedonia and Greece. Ptolemy was given Egypt, Palestine, and uh, Cilicia, Petra, and Cyprus. And then Seleucus really controlled the, the rest of Asia, Syria, Babylon, Persia, and India, everything to the east there. Uh, but eventually, two of those rose to prominence. The Seleucids in uh, Syria and the um, Ptolemies in Egypt. And so this is probably what's in view with the, with the two thighs, and the, 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 um, the belly and the thighs of brass in the, in the statue. Um, and of course, the, there's a buffer state in between these two powers. That's always a buffer state. And that's where the battles happen, which is Israel. So that's a, lo a lot of battles happen between these. And we're going we're gonna to see a lot more detail about that in chapter 11. And the, the, the detail that Daniel gets into in describing the succession of the kings, um, the detail is so precise that 
this is one of the primary reasons that critics have to late date Daniel because there's just so much intricate, precise, accurate detail. There's no other way to really explain away its, its supernatural origin. Uh, so notice that it says that dominion was given to it. So this is a reminder that God, uh, God is in control. He raises up nations for his purposes. Each one of these kingdoms were allowed to come to prominence for God's good pleasure. So that's a reminder to us that even though we may groan and protest about political administrations that we may not agree with, with their, effect, their attacks on the family and the church and our freedoms, that it is God who has allowed this administration to happen. And not only, not only that, but as we make our way through this endless political season of ads and things, we, we can have the confidence that no matter what happens, it's going to be God who allows it to happen. So uh, he's going to raise up this next generation of leaders for our country. So now we come to the fourth and final beast. Uh, and this beast is unlike any of the others. And Daniel's going to spend a good, a good deal of time explaining uh, aspects of this beast and kingdom. And it's previewed here in uh, verses 7 and 8. And then uh, after uh, the vision of, of, uh, of the heavenly throne, uh, Daniel's going to ask more about this. And we'll get some more detail. So verse 7, it says, After this I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, a fourth beast... Dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So up to this point, Daniel has been able to come up with animal analogies to help us uh, you know, picture what these, 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 these images looked or acted like. Uh, but this, this fourth beast is so dreadful, so terrible, that uh, he can't even come up with a, an analogy. He just calls it a beast. Uh, but this is, this is not the only place in Scripture that we see these four images used. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, Hosea 13. Go turn, turn with me to Hosea 13, starting in verse 4. There's a couple spots we'll hit here. 13, Hosea 13, starting in verse 4. It says, Yet I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior besides me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. As they had their pasture, they became satisfied, and being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore they forgot me. This is uh, now verse 7. So I will be like a lion to them. Like a leopard, I will lie in wait by the wayside. I will encounter them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their chests. There I will also devour them like a lioness, as a wild beast would tear them. So it's interesting that we get a, a picture and, and prophecy with all four of these animals listed here. Uh, we see these images in other places in Scripture as well, uh, but none more clearly than in Revelation. Now, I have tried um, to stay out of the book of Revelation as, po as much as possible in this study up until now, uh, precisely so that you can see how Daniel, and not Revelation, really is the foundation of prophecy. Um, we will get into Revelation more in the next few chapters to sort of fill out the details regarding uh, the Antichrist and other issues. Uh, but over in Revelation uh, chapter 13, verse 1, it says... And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. So a lot of the same uh, descriptors. But they all, all seem to be rolled into to one beast. Um, so again, we're, we're looking at these kingdoms of men from, from God's perspective. So perhaps God sees all these, these worldly Gentile empires as, as one prolonged defiance against his, his rule and his authority. 
And it's all personified in this beast that we're going to learn about in Revelation. Uh, yeah? That, that's what I'm, I'm making the correlation to say that these four beasts represent Gentile world domination. And that's the same thing that the beast represents in Revelation 13, but it's personified in the beast that we're going we're gonna to learn about in Revelation, which is the, the, the uh, I guess, the, 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 it goes along with the false prophet. And say, Satan props these guys up as, as world rulers. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a picture even though it's, it is a, it's going to be a person, it, uh, it represents Gentile um, world, um, I guess, defiance against, against God's rule. Does that make sense? In the fourth beast, yes. Uh-huh. The Antichrist. Well, it includes all four. The description has, has the, um, the um, leopard and feet like a bear and the mouth like a lion. And so it has all four descriptors in there as well. So I'm saying it, it, it really is an amalgam of all of these world ruling empires combined into one. Which is, a, like I said, a, it's a, a picture of, of the defiance that mankind has had against God all throughout history. But again, personified in this one person who is going to be the Antichrist. Absolutely, I think it's all. That's what it. That's what it all looks like. It's all intertwined. I think say, say it's it's Dan, Daniel is starting to pull back the curtain, and so that say that there is satanic authorship behind all of these these world empires. Right, and because this beast in Revelation thirteen is. Uh, the descriptors are, are all of those combined. It's really a culmination of all of this defiance against God that is wrapped up in, the, in who the Antichrist is and what he represents. And we're going we're gonna, to um, um, we're gonna get more into the rest of this uh, section in, in Revelation 13 coming up. Um, but then the dragon is also mentioned here in verse 2. And in the chapter prior to this, in Revelation 12, we're getting into the identity of the dragon, which is uh, Satan. And we're going to, like I said, we're going to come back to this section a little bit later. Um, so it says, um, I kept looking in the night visions. And if you recall, this, this could be seen one, as one of the major breaks of the chapter. So these visions are referred to as the night visions of, of Daniel uh, because he uses this phrase uh, several times here. Uh, so this fourth beast is going to be the subject of a lot of discussion. And we're going to see later in this chapter how Daniel really doesn't have any problem with the first three. But this fourth one really kind of troubles him. Um, so he ends up asking a lot of questions about it, which is good for us because then he gets more explanation about uh, what it means. So it says here that it's not only strong, it's exceedingly strong. And this would correspond well to the, the iron metal in the, the, the uh, fourth section of the statue back in chapter 2. Uh, we saw how um, that corresponded with Rome, and here uh, it does as well. So Rome was, was by far the strongest empire that has ever been. We saw how in that metal statue that the, uh, the quality decreased from kingdom to kingdom, from metal to metal. But the strength increased. Um, and so we, 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 uh, we see that, um, uh, that, uh, that progression um, here as well. Uh, it says uh, that, it, it, and here it says that it has iron teeth. 
So you get the iron as a clear connection back to chapter 2 as well. But then it says that it devoured and crushed and trampled down uh, with its feet, and all that remained. So whatever it did not get with this large iron teeth, it, it, uh, it took care of by stomping on it. Uh, it then says that this beast was different than all the rest. So how was it different? Um, you know, all of these kingdoms conquered their enemies. They all took spoil. They all subjugated and, and taxed uh, these foreign nations. So, so how are they different? Well, first it says the beast trampled down and crushed those it conquered. So I think this is, this is the direction that where we can see one way that it's different than all the rest. Their, their brutality really did set Rome apart. Uh, for example, we saw how, how Babylon and Persia were extremely uh, enlightened in how they treated their conquered peoples. Uh, Babylon would take the best of the groups that they conquered. Uh, they would put them to work in their own leadership and train them to serve in the, the government of Babylon and also to, to train them to, to go back to their home countries and serve them for Babylon. So we saw that back in chapter 1 with, with Daniel and, and his three friends being trained uh, for a period of years. So this, this was really a very enlightened way of going about things. Uh, similarly, Persia would, would honor the gods of the peoples that they conquered. Uh, not just the Jews, but others as well. So they returned the, the idols and the statues and all those things back to the peoples when, uh, when they took over from Babylon. Um, and they even included worship of these gods in their own religious practices. They took the best of, of the cultures that they conquered. Uh, there were also many Jewish leaders that, uh, that were part of uh, leadership in the, in, in the history of Persia. So like I said, they took advantage of the cultures rather than destroying them. And then Greece was also similar in that they didn't really destroy the, the nations that they conquered. They, they did export their own culture and their own language to try to unify things. But um, Rome was different. It says here that Rome crushed and broke into pieces all the cultures and societies it defeated. Uh, Rome took pride in how um, it, it conquered societies. Uh, and it demolished these societies. So it says it trampled down with its feet uh, the remainder. Rome was absolutely brutal. Another way that this beast was different was that it had ten horns. Uh, this was another connection to the, the, the fourth section in the statue in chapter 2. There were ten toes of that final phase of the, of the kingdom. And here there are ten horns. Again, we're going to get more description of the, of the meaning of these horns at the end of this chapter. And also by looking at other, other passages. But... What this chapter does for us is, is fill out our understanding of uh, what was discussed in chapter 2. So we have more detail here. Uh, back with the ten toes in, in, in chapter 2, we didn't know that there were going to be ten kings. But in chapter 7 here, in verse 24, it actually says that these are uh, they're revealed as ten kings. Another way that uh, this kingdom is different is by looking at how it ends. So Babylon was conquered by the Persians. The Persians were conquered by the Greeks. Greece was conquered by Rome. But who conquered Rome? No one, right? Uh, Rome lasted as a unified power until the 3rd or 4th century BC, but I mean AD. But then they, they, it started to, to crumble into its various pieces. But those pieces continued to rule the world. And, and they still rule the world today. Uh, the influence that Rome Wielded, it, it, it literally still rules the world. So this is going to be something we get to through. So it, it broke up into various pieces like Germany and France and England and all, all these, these pieces. And so each one of those pieces has had its, had its bid at world domination over the centuries. But it, it's still... And well, I think America, you could, you could see, it could maybe, maybe could be one of the young lions, the, 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 the offspring of, of uh, England. Um, so there's, there's still a, a sense in which the, uh, in, in which the, the ideology and the, the, the uh, influence that, that they set up still rules the world uh, in, in, in quite, a, quite a, different way, a few different ways. Now we're going to get into what that is going to look like in in the, um, when we talk about the, 
the ten toes and the ten um, horns um, throughout the rest of this, this book as well. But they, again, Rome was never conquered. And that's, that's an important thing to see because, um, well, when we get to, to Revelation some more. Um, verse 8. So it says, While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. Um, so you should see the, the, the drawings and pictures of, that people try to, to make of this, this little horn with this giant mouth. It's just hilarious. Um, so Daniel here was, was contemplating the horns. It, it sounds like they were perplexing to him. Uh, so while he was thinking about what they meant, another horn, a little one, comes up amidst the others. Um, notice it says that this is not one of the ten original horns. It comes up among the other horns. So there, these are, if these are ten kings, then, then this little horn is another king or ruler of some sort. So this horn uh, starts out small and, and somehow, somehow uh, later becomes more significant. So what we have um, it really is an emerging leader who, though, although he starts out uh, small, will end up being really the, the, the big guy, the one in charge. Um, now, there, there is also another little horn in chapter 8, and we need to be sure not to confuse the two. When we get there, we're going to see that uh, the one from chapter 8 is specifically uh, pertaining to the Greek Empire, and this one pertains to the Roman. Uh, but we're also going to be reminded how God prepares us for what is to come. And that's what God does in prophecy. He prepares us for what is to come. He gives us previews of what he's going to do. Like I said, that's how God operates in prophecy. So this, the little horn in chapter 8 may actually serve as a preview uh, for what this little horn in chapter 7 will end up doing in the, in the end, end times of the, the, the Roman Empire. So... Uh, these three kings, they, uh, they didn't seem to go along with the program of this little horn, and so they're torn out by the roots before him. And it's later clarified that he actually subdues these three kings. Uh, for us, the idea of a, of a horn as a picture of a leader may seem like a strange idea, but in ancient cultures, the power of an animal was seen in its horns. Uh, so a horn became an idiom for authority or power. Uh, so it's perfectly natural for the, for the readers of this to understand uh, the, the horn representing kings or, or leaders. Uh, now the description uh, here pointing out that it has eyes and a mouth that emphasizes that this is a person. It's clearly a person. Uh, previously in the kingdom of Babylon, um, uh, Babylon was, was personified as a person as in, in, in Nebuchadnezzar. So so here, whatever, whatever authority or, or rule is, is represented here is, is centralized in a person. And that's similar, again, to what we saw in Revelation 13. Um, now, we're going to get a lot of detail about this guy when we get to uh, Daniel 11 and 12. And, and we'll springboard into Revelation uh, as well. Uh, but there's a lot we know about this, this, this little horn. There are uh, 33 titles uh, used of him in the Old Testament and, and 13 in the New. And there's actually a physical description of him as well. So, um, but this is the first time he shows up in the book of Daniel. But we're going to have to wait until next time to see who this guy is and, and see what, what part he plays in the drama. But this is exciting. We're getting into the, the meat of the prophetic material that we've been building up to all throughout the book. Yeah. Daniel is in his present time, and he's getting a vision of four world empires. And so, right, and so what I'm saying, though, is that Rome is future to him at that point, but then we're going to say, we're going to argue that it extends all the way until the second coming. So all of that is future to him.
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a, that's a foundational principle for really understanding both Daniel and Revelation and how the end times are going to unfold. So, um, so like I said, we've, we've been building up to this prophetic material all throughout the first half of the book of, of, of Daniel. Um, but but like, like we mentioned a, a few uh, chapters back, this, this journey really was necessary. Uh, the, this section that, uh, that we're in now wouldn't make sense without having taken that journey through the life and ministry of Daniel. We wouldn't have had the context to uh, understand um, how God was speaking through Daniel. Uh, like I mentioned before, you really do uh, need to study the first half of Daniel to get to know the characters, the main players, to understand their, their situation and their, their moral foundation, um, the lessons that God was teaching them in the, in, in the book, and, and the lessons he's teaching, for us, uh, teaching us today. So o- only then will the prophetic program really start to make sense. So what can we take away from this? Well, we can be confident that God is sovereign. If, he, if he's going to tell us and list for us all of these world empires, uh, we can understand that he is in control of the, you know, what will happen in the affairs of man. That he is orchestrating events to bring about his ends in his time. Uh, God lays out uh, for Nebuchadnezzar in, in chapter 2 a vision of the future. And then he reaffirms it in chapter 7 with more detail and gives his perspective on things as well. Uh, that means that uh, God knows the future. God is omniscient and sometimes reveals secrets to men. Uh, but not only does God know the future, but God is the one who holds the entire universe in his hands. And he is, he, he is intimately involved with and cares about uh, even the details of our lives. So we can take away that e- even though world empires will rise and fall, uh, that God is in control and he will come to make all things right. I think that really is the message. All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, we stand in awe of who you are. You are so amazing. I just thank you so much for revealing yourself to us through this book. And uh, just help us to understand just a glimpse of, of your power and your majesty and your sovereignty, Lord, that we can uh, just rest and trust and know that you are in control, Lord. Again, bless this journey as we're, as we're uh, diving deep into the book of Daniel, Lord, and help us to uh, hear the messages that you have us here. Uh, just, just keep us safe as we leave tonight. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.